All right, church, we're in Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. We've been going through the book of Acts, and this is a great place for us to kind of take a break. We're only going to look at the first three verses, Acts 13, 1 through 3. And don't give me a hard time because we went through a whole chapter last time. We did all of chapter 12. But from this point on, we're gonna, it's a turning point in the book of Acts. Up to this point, we've been, really the whole reason I wanted to study Acts and preach through Acts is because I wanted to see the early church, the birth of the church and how the church grew and became you know, a model for us. And to see that maybe the church that we have today, that we see today, isn't exactly how it can be, how God intended it to be. So to look at the early church as a model and say, maybe we can do better. Maybe we can be kind of see our imperfections and where we have gone astray as the body of Christ in our worship services and the people of God and, and get back to the basics, get back to what the, the supernatural, amen, and get back to what the Spirit of God can do through the people of God. And I hope that's what you've been seeing. So we're going to see today a church that has grown up. And, and, from this, and then when we come back in January to the book of Acts, I should say, because we'll We'll, we're going to see the ministry of Paul. You know, it's not so much the growth of the church and Peter and, and all of those things. Now we're going to see Paul on his missionary. We get to walk with Paul on his missionary journeys. And, and I think that's exciting as well. And honestly, I don't even know what to expect from that. But this is a turning point. But I do. You know, we get to walk with Paul on his journeys and learn from his stories as Luke tells us his stories, and, and they're fascinating. I love listening to missionaries. When missionaries come into the church and they tell us their stories because how they stepped out of their comfort zone, they stepped into the unknown and not knowing what to expect and going into a foreign land where they may not know the language or the culture and just following, being obedient to the call of God and, and seeing what God could do and the miracles and the testimonies. I love hearing missionary stories. It's some of my favorite testimonies because they're absolutely amazing. I remember missionaries would come into our church periodically and share their experiences. And it was exciting and terrifying at the same time. As a new believer, I'm like, wow, you left home, you left everything you know, you went to Africa or, or wherever. And, and, and I'd be amazed that people would do that. And, and to come back with their stories was so exciting, but terrifying. It's like, Lord, don't call me. <laughs> What if he calls me to do that? What if he calls me to leave my home and my family and everything and go to Africa where I don't know anything and I don't know the culture? And, and that would be that was terrifying. Am I the only one? Because I, in my heart, I knew if God called me, well, I kind of had to go. <laughs> what I didn't know was that if God calls me, he'll have prepared me to go and that I want to go. You know, 30 years later, my heart wants to go. If God called me to, to missions, I'm gone. Sorry, church, I'm gone. I would love to go. But God has not called me to missions. God has called me here. I've been on mission trips. I'm talking about mission, the mission field out, you know. And, and, but God has prepared me if that, man, Lord, here I am. Call, here I am. If you want me to go, call, I'm, I'm available. You know, because we grow, don't we? From that young excited, terrified believer. Oh, that sounds so much fun, but just don't call. To, here I am, Lord, send me. You know, we all go through spiritual progression, don't we? We see it here in the early church. They started, they didn't know, the Holy Spirit came and they started, but they had a lot to grow in. They had a lot of learning but along the way. A lot, to, a lot to relearn. That's why I love Jesus' analogy of being born again. Isn't that such a great analogy? We, we're born again. We're born anew. We, have to, we start out like spiritual infants, but we have to be taught everything, taught everything from a spiritual perspective to put away our carnal thoughts and our carnal ideas and worldviews and begin to develop new, brand new spiritual thoughts and spiritual ideas. Our minds are being renewed and we're literally born again spiritually. We need to grow up spiritually. And we've been watching the early church grow up, the church that was born in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. How did they grow up? Well, they, first they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. 
Jesus spent three and a half years developing the apostles so that when the church was born, they could teach them. They were the spiritual fathers to teach these newborn children how what you know, the the ways of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus. And that's what they needed. They needed that spiritual father, the spiritual fathers to teach them. That's how. But then they devoted themselves to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. So they would gather together and build each other up, encourage and edify one another. And they would they would break bread together. They would have meals together, you know, learning to love one another, learning to love one another with different backgrounds and all the they had to learn how to love. How do you learn how to love one another like Christ loved us? Well, you got to get together to do that. So they would have meals and fellowships together and learn how to love one another. And they would have communion together. They would share in the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. And that is significant. That is important that we do that together. And they would pray together. That's important, church. You've heard me say it before. I love y'all. I'm close to y'all, but I'm closest to those that pray, that I pray with. Those who come on Tuesday mornings faithfully every Tuesday morning at seven o'clock, you know, we share and we, our stories, we, we share our needs, we pray together. And when you pray together, you become closer to those people. They prayed together. They gathered together frequently, daily, and they did all it, but they prayed together. You know, it's important. That's a model, isn't it? The model of how to grow as a new believer. You want a new believer's class? There it is. There it is. You begin to do these things and you learn, you come together and we pray together. Absolutely important. It's how we grow. It's why we gather together like this. But we don't stop there, do we? See, many of us have stopped there and are growing, but we're just getting fat, spiritually fat. You know, we're coming together. Listen to the listen. When I'm teaching, it's the apostles' teaching. I'm not an apostle, but I'm teaching the apostles' teaching, aren't I? You come, you listen to the apostles' teaching, and we gather together, and we fellowship, and we pray, and and do these things. But that's it. And we just keep receiving and receiving and receiving, and we just get like Eli said. Yeah, you know, I, I was the same way. I shouldn't have gone back for seconds because I was just. And, and spiritually, we can get that way, just lazy, and we're not doing anything with it. We're not exercising. We're not exercising the gifts that God is developing within us, the calling that God has call, called us to when we're just receiving and taking in. See, they had to go and use the gifts and calling God had given each of them. So God allowed persecution to get them out of Jerusalem and fulfill God's call to go to Judea, Samaria, to the rest of the earth. You know, God said, you guys aren't doing what I told you. I've built you up. I've encouraged you. I've taught you. Now go. And if you're not going to go, I'm going to push you out. And he allowed persecution to come to get him out. And what did they do when they got out of the city? Well, they began to grow again. They began to learn things they would not have learned. Oh, then they go to Samaria and Philip begins to preach in Samaria. And oh my goodness, the Samaritans got saved. Who knew? Who knew that the gospel could go to the Samaritans? We didn't know that sitting in Jerusalem, but now we know. And it goes all the way as far as Antioch, the pagan city of Antioch, the Las Vegas of today. And oh my goodness, they start talking about Jesus and the pagan Gentile Antioch people get saved. Who knew? They're learning, right? They're learning as and growing as they're going. All that was imparted to them, they begin to take out and share to the lost world, and people are getting saved, and the church is growing. Their church is growing, and now in Antioch, they, they basically start a mega church in Antioch. We looked at that Well, the last time we were here, two weeks ago in chapter 12, and Antioch will become the center for missionaries being sent out into the world. Antioch becomes really the hub of the church from this point on. Not so much Jerusalem, but but Antioch uh, for missions activity, for activity in the church. So we see Antioch as a model for the church today. We've gone from Pentecost to Antioch. And I I love, we started in January in the book of Acts. We've watched the church be born. We've watched the church grow. And I, I believe in these three verses, if you look hard enough, 
we see the model church. We see what God had intended for the church all along. We see the really the fulfillment of the church, and that's what we're going to look at today. Now we start. We ended actually in verse twenty-five and verse of chapter twelve. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry, and they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So the church in Antioch, if you remember, they took up an offering for the church in Jerusalem during the famine. And that's what the church does. The church is a storehouse, right? You bring your tithes and your offering into the storehouse, and and it's not to be hoarded within the church. It's to be used, whether that's another church that needs help, whether that's people in the within the church. It's to be used for the ministry of the church, for the, expanding the kingdom of God. The church has a responsibility not to hoard God's resources, but to use and steward God's resources wisely. And they wisely chose to send aid to another church in Jerusalem. And, and I'm telling you, boards are funny, man, when, when it comes to money. You better have a spiritual board, a spiritually minded board, because what do you mean? We can't take all this money and send it out of here. We, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? How are, who's going to provide for us? We're in a famine. What do we say when, when, you, when, you have, when you steward God's resources wisely, when you have an open hand and open heart, God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. You won't have anything. It's as soon as you say, well, what about us? What are we going to do? Well, who's going to help us if we give them all of this money? Well, that's when, that's when God's blessings run out. That's when you're going to need somebody to help you. Amen. So, by the way, the harvest offering at the last count was um, and it will probably continue to grow, was at $370,000. That's one offering, $370,000. That's remarkable. Every year, I told you, every year I think it's going to go down, and it doesn't. I think that's, it, it will, you know, people continue to give to that throughout, you know, probably for the next month or so. And but if you come to the business meeting in February, we'll have the final number for that. But that's just a testimony to what God is doing. God is up to something, isn't he? God is up to something. And, and all of that gets used, you know, for the kingdom of God. You know, I'm not going to get a bit better motorcycle because the heart, yeah, no. It does, it will, nothing changes for me or Pastor Rick or the staff, you know. But now we know what we can do as far as building projects and things like that. And, 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 and now we know we have plenty to, to minister, you know. I won't get into that, but I want, but um, so the offering from Antioch was delivered by Barnabas and Saul, delivered by Barnabas and Saul. And I love that the two leaders in the church, the, the big shots, right? The pastor, the two pastors of the church, they deliver the offering. I was like, wouldn't you send, isn't that kind of a menial job? You know, they're going to make them walk all the way back to Jerusalem to deliver the offering. But I think it sets the tone for the church. The leadership of the church sets the example. You follow the leader, right? You follow, and the leadership of the church should be out doing God's will, doing God's work. And the, I believe the church follows that. So I, I just love that. I don't know. I'm not saying that's why it's there, but I do believe it's a, it's a valid point. You know, you need to see your leaders, you know, doing the will and the work of God. And they brought back John. Now, this isn't the Apostle John. It's John Mark, the one who wrote the Gospel of Mark, the first gospel. He was also Barnabas' cousin. I want you to think about John Mark for a moment. Because a young man at the church in Jerusalem, he was younger than the rest. He was a boy. He was just a young boy following Jesus and the disciples around when he could. When they were in the area, John Mark would follow them around. And it says here in Mark... 14, in the Garden of Gethsemane when, when Jesus was arrested. Now a certain young man, interesting he didn't put his name in there. <laughs> There's a reason. A certain young man followed him, Jesus, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body, and the young man laid hold of him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. That's John Mark. That's the young man. Pastor Rick has a great teaching on that, how, how he fled from, he heard that they were getting, there was something happening, that he was, Jesus was about to get rested, and he got up out of his bed and wrapped himself in a linen cloth and, and ran out to see what was going on to warn Jesus, they're coming for you, Jesus, they're coming for you. And in the process, he gets caught up in this, and, and they 
go to seize hold of him. That's why he was wrapped naked. He didn't take his time to get dressed, properly dressed to run out. He went out to warn Jesus, and, and, and he's left naked as they grab hold of his cloth. And his, but he, he's, look at all the experiences John Mark got to have, this young boy, because he hung around Jesus. He hung around the disciples. Now his cousin Barnabas comes from Antioch and says, John, you, you won't believe what's going on in Antioch. That, that pagan city that, that we, we don't have nothing to do with, that we won't go near, well, they're getting saved, and the church is growing. We've been ministering there. And, and John Mark says, can I come? Can I come with you? And let me get me out of my church. Get me, I got to get out of this church in Jerusalem, and I want to get on the road with you guys. I want to hang out with you guys because that's where the action is. That's where things are really happening. And, and he latches on to Barnabas and Saul, and it completely changes the course of his life the directory of his life because he got out of the church in Jerusalem and goes on an adventure with Barnabas. Now, he wasn't perfect by any stretch. We know he's a young man and, and he's going to abandon it. We'll see it next year. He abandons them, but then he comes back. But he writes, because he left his church, went on th his, these adventures, he wrote the first gospel recorded, the Gospel of Mark. And we're talking about him today because he got out of the church and did something. You know, I shared with you about Brother Tyrone, man. I, I wanted to get out of the church and do something, you know, as a new believer. But I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. I have no idea what to do. So I latched on to Brother Tyrone because he was the only one I saw actually going out and doing things. And I have some great stories from it, some crazy stories. You've heard some of them. I mean, but more importantly, I am who I am today, partly because of those adventures with Brother Tyrone. And many of you have latched on to me, which is great. You know, you come out when we do our crazy events like the Halloween thing and the Easter event and the, you know, the um, biker pit stop. All right, Jim, Pastor Jim, I'm going to hang out with you and we'll see what happens. And you came, many of you came with me um, Thursday. We had, what, 17 or so people from, from this fellowship, which is incredible, to the feeding the homeless on Thanksgiving that Larry and Vonda do. And, and you got your stories. You got some stories. You got to grow up a little bit. You got to see your gifts, your calling and your gifts. You know, what, what God is, you, and you, you would gravitate to those gifts that you did. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience. You grew up a little. You learned some things about God and you learned some things about yourself when you step out. You know, if you came Thursday, you learned some things about yourself. You learned what, what you can do and what you, what you might not want to do. You know, those who are in leader, who, who have leadership gifts, well, there's leadership, areas of leadership, right? Somebody had to lead the packing of the, you know. <laughs> no, somebody had to be downstairs leading, wrapping the utensils and, and doing all that stuff. And, and leaders rose up. In those, and some just were happy to do that. You know what? My, I, I'm just happy with the menial task of rolling up silverware. But you know what? That was needed too. And, and you gravitate to that. Others gravitate to service. You know, I, I want to serve. I want to be the one to scoop the food out. Or I want to be the one to, to hold the plates, to fill the plates. And, and you, you learn that this is where this is where I'm good at. This is what I'm good at. Maybe I'm just good at cleaning up. Just leave me alone. Let me clean up. Or maybe I'm the one that needs to go sit at the table with the guests, with the homeless, and, and, and minister to them and talk to them. You know, you, you find, you gravitate to your gifts when you go out and do, you learn something about yourself. You learn, you grew up a little bit. Today we're going to look out, look at a church that grew up a little bit, that grew up a lot in the church in Antioch. So starting in verse 1, Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. So he singles out five men. But notice that the whole event begins with a group of Christians in the church in Antioch who are exercising their spiritual gifts that were given to them. Now, we know Barnabas right, and Saul. They were leaders in the church. You know, we expect them to be involved, right? But who are these other three? We don't know much about them at all, do we? B understand, God gives everyone in the church gifts to be used. God has a calling for everyone in the church. Church, we're going to see. You're not going to like this sermon in a minute. 
you're going to see that we all have a role to play that for the church to function as the church is supposed to function. We've been talking about it lately, how it's church is not a spectator sport. It's not you don't come sit in the seats to be entertained, to be entertained by the by the leadership, by the pastor, by the music. No, we all have an integral role in the ministry of the church. Notice Luke refers to certain prophets and teachers. There were certain prophets and teachers. What does that mean to me when I see certain prophets and teachers? That means out of there were many prophets and teachers in the body. And these certain ones did something. These, God used these certain ones. He called out these certain ones, meaning there were more. There were more. There were prophets and teachers in the body that God is about to use. This is important because we've been studying the book of Acts to see how the early church did it. They're a model for us of spiritual health and growth. They weren't perfect. Like I said, they had to grow and learn. So God, through the Holy Spirit, gave some to be apostles who would teach them the gospel and the ways of Jesus. But he didn't stop with the apostles. He didn't stop there. Look what Paul says in Ephesians 4, 11. And he himself, Jesus, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. God gave gifts, these gifts. He gave, he called, he gave their callings and he equips the calling with gifts to be prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Who are those people? Well, that's you guys. That's all of us. We are all in ministry. But don't call me a minister because we're all ministers. Am I a minister? Yeah. My gifting, my calling is to be a pastor, but you are ministers too. What is your calling? Is it to be a pastor? Is it to be an evangelist? Is it to be a teacher? Is it to be a prophet? We see all of these gifts in the five men here in this one verse and the purpose being fulfilled in verses two and three. Barnabas, we know well, he had the gift of prophecy. He had the gift of encouragement that he was given the name, the nickname Barnabas because he was a son of encouragement. It means son of encouragement. Don't we need people? Don't we need Barnabases in the church? People who are gifted with encouragement. You know, we have enough doom and gloom people. We have enough complainers. We need people gifted with the gift of encouragement that that build us up, that encourage us. And that's he was a prophet. But that's what a prophet does. A prophet is an encourager. First Corinthians, Paul says, first Corinthians 14. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. That's what a prophet does. They build us up. God uses prophets to build up the body of Christ, to edify, to comfort. Well, let me go on. There's Simon, then there's Simeon. I'm sorry. It could be Simon. His name, he was given the nickname Niger, which suggests that he was a black man from, from what we now call Nigeria in Africa. Some say that he was, it's very possible, it's likely even, that he was the same Simon who helped Jesus carry, who was commissioned to help Jesus carry the cross. I mean, could you imagine if that's who this is? You know, the testimony that he has, every time he opens his mouth, he's talking about the Jesus that, that he saw, that he helped, and the salvation that, that came to him. And Lucius, we don't know anything about him. Likely, also another black man who, who was probably ministered to and witnessed to by Simon from Simon from Cyrene, who ended up here, God brought here to Antioch. And then there's Manaean, Manaean, who grew up with Herod the Tetrarch, who was Herod, the one that, that had John the Baptist killed. So these, they grew up together from the womb, basically. They grew up together, so you know that he was well-to-do. He was in a place of royalty, uh, of high, high esteem. And isn't it amazing how two lives go separate ways? Herod, ended, he's dead, and, 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 this, and Manaean is, is serving God. He's a believer in Jesus Christ. He's... he's exercising his gifts in the church. But what do you see? And then there's Paul or Saul. This chapter, by the way, he'll, he will, after partway through this chapter, we'll start calling him Paul. It'll be a lot easier because from the rest of the time, the rest of the time will be known, he'll be known as Paul, his Greek name. Paul was 
born, he was raised as a Pharisee, to be a Pharisee in, in all the ways of the Lord and traditions of the law and everything. And, and what do you see in these five men? They're all different, aren't they? They're all diverse, very diverse. You have a couple Jewish men, a couple Greek, a couple um, Africans. You have different backgrounds, different upbringing. You have diversity. What did the church learn? That God is no respecter of persons. It took a while for the church in Jerusalem to learn that, didn't it? But by stepping out, by exercising the gifts that God has given, they learned that, listen, God is, God is no respecter of persons, that we are one in Christ. The church cannot be the church unless we realize that we are one in Christ, that God sees us all the same, that there are no differences among men. Paul says, you know, in Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. And that was a big one. Because there was Jew and Greek. You know, they, they did not like each other. They did not think of each other as equals. They thought one, each group thought one was superior to the other and, and inferior. There is neither group, Greek, Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Think about it. Sometimes there were slaves who got saved and then their masters got saved, and they went to the same church. Sometimes there were slaves who were in higher positions in the church than the masters. How does that work? Guess what? It doesn't. So what happens to slavery in Christ? It simply dissolves because you begin to, everything that you... There is no superiority complex. There is no inferiority complex. You realize that we are all one in Christ. It simply dissolves away. What is the answer to slavery? Jesus Christ. What happens to racism in the church? It simply dissolves away because in Christ we are all the same. And, and we can't help but realize that. It's why, you know, it, it just falls apart. You no longer see others as inferior and you no longer to you or superior to you. It's why I can go into the prison one day and minister to inmates in white jumpsuits and the very next day go to Legislative Hall and minister to college educated men in suits holding political office and look at them exactly the same with exactly the same value and be able to talk to them and minister to them with no prejudice or no with nothing. I don't think that I'm better than those in the prison, and I don't think that I'm inferior to those in legislative hall. In Christ, I see everybody with equal value because we are. We are. That's what the church, that's what the early church learned. They had to grow there. They didn't know that. They still don't fully understand it. They're not quite there yet. We're going to see later in Acts. They have to have a meeting to figure all this out. But However, they're learning and they're growing. And we see it here in Antioch. We see five diverse individuals serving God, using their gifts, as you're going to see in a very important way. I was really moved Wednesday night, if you were there at the night, the Thanksgiving Eve service. There are probably 500, at least 500 people there in Georgetown. And by the end of the night, after all the testimonies and the music, I mean, I just had this overwhelming sense of oneness. Like, man, in this moment, in this moment, after, with what the Spirit of God had just done, God was glorified in the testimonies, in the songs, and I just sensed an overwhelming oneness. Now, I don't know what happened when we left there, but in that moment, in the Spirit, we were one. We were one. 500 unique, diverse individuals became one. I don't think anything could have, could have took, took that away in that moment. If you were, I see heads shaking. If you were there, you know what I'm talking about. Because that's what God does. That's what a healthy church looks like. Our differences, our skin color, our nationality, our backgrounds, our cultural differences, none of that matters because it doesn't matter to God. So it shouldn't matter to us. I was proud of the body of Christ in that moment and proud to be a part of it. But anyway, that's really not what verse 1 is all about. But it's certainly there. It's certainly there. Luke gives us verse 1 to set up verse 2 and 3. Some had the gift of prophecy, some the gift of teaching. And with that, verse 2, and as they ministered 
to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, having fasted and prayed, laid hands on them, they sent them away. As they were ministering to the Lord, as they were worshiping the Lord, I want, to, I want you to get the picture. That's what they were doing. When we worship the Lord, when we're singing to the Lord, we're ministering to the Lord. Another tra- other translations say worship. They worship the Lord. I, I, I don't know why I said it last service. I'll say it again. One of the worst things you could ever allow me to hear in your presence is I didn't get anything out of the worship service. Ah, I just didn't feel anything in the worship service. We're, it's not for you. It's not, we're not worshiping so you can feel good. We're ministering to the Lord. We're worshiping the Lord. So don't tell me that. Don't even let me hear that you didn't get anything out of the worship. Don't even think that anymore. You don't come into a worship service for you. We are ministering to the Lord. We're worshiping the Lord for he is good. He is worthy. Amen. Amen. All right. Now I got that off my chest. As they were worshiping the Lord, they were also fasting and praying. It doesn't say praying, but they didn't fast without praying. There's no reason to fast if you're not going to pray. It, they two go together. You fast and you pray. And what happened? Think, get the picture. The church comes together. You have your leaders. You have Saul. You have Barnabas. They come back. The church is singing to the Lord. They're ministering to the Lord as they're fasting, as they're praying, And what happens in that setting? The Holy Spirit interrupted their service. During the song service, how dare you interrupt? No, during the song service, the Holy Spirit spoke to them. Don't you want to hear from the Holy Spirit? Shouldn't that be part of our services that the Holy Spirit speaks to us? It may not be every time, but there are times in our services that the Holy Spirit wants to interrupt our service and speak to us, has a word for us. I believe, how the Holy Spirit said, how did the Holy Spirit speak? How did the Holy Spirit speak? Was it through the the speakers, the the sound system? Was it an audible voice? Was it a still small voice? No, we're already told how the Holy Spirit spoke. Through the prophets. The Holy Spirit spoke through the prophets. Oh boy, here we go. Pastor Jim's getting Pentecostal on us now. The Holy Spirit interrupted the worship service and spoke a word through the prophets in the church. He took Five of them. Some of, maybe there was three. I think I believe there was three prophets. He spoke through the three prophets. There were other prophets, but he spoke through these three prophets. I believe it was through tongues and interpretation. I believe the Bible says it's very likely that it was through tongues and interpretation. Paul says in giving instructions to the Corinthian church who got out of hand. We have all we know about tongues is from Corinthians. Paul correcting the church that got out of hand with speaking in tongues. But that doesn't mean there's not a place for tongues and interpretation and for prophecy in the church. Because he says in 1 Corinthians 14, if anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at the most three. So I believe there was three of these men of these prophets spoke in tongues, and there was an interpreter. But if there is no interpreter, and, and let one interpret, but if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak or pray in tongues to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. Let the others weigh what was spoken. God will always confirm his message through another You know, God never gives just a message to one person and doesn't confirm it. Weigh what was said. When God interrupts your service through a prophet, through a prophetic word, which I believe comes from tongues and interpretation, well, consider what is said. Weigh what has been spoken. Weigh carefully what is said. We're just given the names of five men who are prophets and teachers who the Holy Spirit spoke through and confirmed what the Spirit said. Now, some of you may be uncomfortable with spiritual gifts like tongues and prophecy. Maybe you were taught that they passed with the apostles. They're gone. They're not for today. Well, you won't find evidence of that in the Bible. 
Study your Bible and come back to me with the evidence that they passed away. Don't tell me what you've been taught by other churches. Tell me what the Bible has teaches you. If you can find evidence in the Bible that they passed away, I'll be all ears. But you won't. You will not find evidence in the Bible that the gifts like prophecy, like tongues, like any of those gifts have passed away with the apostles. God still uses prophets today. Not to predict the future. That's not what their gifting is. Unless, you know, it's in the word of God, unless it could be, you know, it's part of the revealed word of God. God doesn't use prophets to, you know, add to what we already have in the word of God. That's a false prophet. If someone comes in here and says they're a prophet of God and begins to tell you things that aren't in the Bible, well, the Bible warns about them. We just studied the book of Jude. Beware of false prophets who come in, you know, at like, like wolves, right? Beware of those if they're adding to the word of God. But God will use prophets to minister the word of God in the moment of God. You know, there may be something in the word of God today that God wants to speak to us. That's how the church was operating. God, listen, God wanted to speak something in that moment, and he used the prophets to do it. Think about, I think, you know, God uses prophets to declare what God wants us to do today. And it will always line up with the word of God, and it will always be confirmed by others, and also what the Holy Spirit is speaking to the church or individuals personally. I don't believe this came as a surprise to Paul and Barnabas. Or, you know, I believe that God was already working on their hearts. You know what? We've been here a year. I, I feel God leading us out of here. I feel God leading us out of here, but, but, but I don't know. I'm not sure. So what does God do? Think about it. What does God do? He uses prophets in the church to lead Paul, to confirm what he's already telling Paul and Barnabas in their spirits to go. How did Think about it. We have the rest of the, listen, we're, we're almost halfway through. We're almost at the halfway point in the book of Acts. The rest of the book of Acts is the, is the ministry of Paul. It's his three missionary journeys, four if you count being imprisoned in Rome, which he was still a missionary even in prison. So we would not have that. We would not have the rest of the book of Acts had the church not exercise the gift of prophecy in the church to confirm in Paul and Barnabas what God wanted them to do. Are you, are you getting this? Do you think you have value in the body of Christ? Do you think that if the church back then was just a spectator sport, that if everything was happening from the leadership, listen, that we don't get the book of Acts. We don't, we get to walk with Paul through his missionary journeys because they listen to the prophecies coming out of the people of God, those sitting in the seats. Do you see your value? Do you see how when we're exercising the gifts that God's given us, the importance of that to the, to the kingdom of God, to the, we don't have the ministry. Paul would have stayed there. Barnabas would have stayed there, not fulfilling their calling. God used people, five, four, sorry, three people, three prophets in the church to confirm what he was already doing in their hearts, told them, get out of here. Paul, Barnabas, you got to get out of here. That doesn't even make sense. There are two leaders in the church. It doesn't, listen, it's like God calling, tell, like, I feel God leading me out of here. And if I just leave, what does that leave with you with? But if God calls me out of here, if God's leading me, he's going to confirm it through you. You're going to be like, Pastor Jim, you got to go. God is calling you out of here. It's okay, Pastor Jim. God's already told me you got to go. Are you following? If God has a call on my life outside of this pulpit, he's going to confirm it through you. I need you to help confirm what he's dealing. I'm not saying he's doing that. I do not sense that whatsoever. I'm just using it as an example. If God is leading me out of here, I need confirmation. He will use you to confirm it. Whew. We see what we see here is a pattern for the church. Listen, they worshiped, they fasted and prayed, and they listened for the Holy Spirit, and they were exercising the gifts that were given them. We don't see the ministry of the Holy Spirit today. Why don't we see the ministry of the Holy Spirit today like they did then? Why don't we see the ministry of the Holy Spirit today like they did then? Let me tell you, it's not because the gifts ceased. 
with the, with the apostles. It ceased when the people ceased worshiping and fasting and praying like they did. We stopped denying ourselves daily. We stopped sacrificing. Oh, it's just too much work. I mean, I only have so much time in a day. I don't have time to read my Bible. Fasting, I have a hard time fasting. I got so much to do. When, when, when can I squeeze fasting into my schedule? When, I could, when can I discipline myself to fast when I have so many things to do? I need the energy to do it. You know, fasting and prayer. How am I going to know the will of God clearly if I'm not fasting and praying? When, when we've stopped disciplining ourselves, denying ourselves, sacrificing ourselves, the gifts ceased. Not because God stopped them, because we stopped. We stopped exercising them. We stopped developing them. We want the fruits of the Spirit and the, without putting in the work and the sacrifice. Like the person who says, I, I buy my meat from the grocery store where there's no animals were harmed. It doesn't work. We want to eat the meat, but we don't, want the sacri- we don't want to sacrifice the animal. We want all the gifts. We want to see them operating, but we don't, we're not willing to put in the work to make the sacrifices. No, God gives us gifts but we have to work to develop them within ourselves. They don't just happen, church. Look what Paul tells Timothy, who he's training and preparing for his own ministry. Timothy is taking over the ministry. He's going to be the pastor in Ephesus for many years. Paul is preparing him. What does he tell Timothy in 1 Timothy 4? He says, do not neglect the gift that is in you which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Meditate on them. Give yourself entirely to them. Entirely to what? To the gifts, to meditating on the gifts, to developing the gifts, to not neglecting the gifts. They take work, church. He said, Peter, you have the gifts. You have them. You've been given them. They were acknowledged when, they, when the elders laid hands on you. They're saying, we acknowledge you have these gifts in you. We see these gifts in you. Don't neglect them. Meditate on them. Develop them. Further, give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. That your progress, that you'll grow in these things, that people will continue to see these gifts in you. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Don't go living outside the doctrine. Don't go living an ungodly life and expect yourself to grow in these gifts. Follow the word of God. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. What did, why didn't Paul just say, do not neglect the gift that is in you? Go to church every Sunday, and in doing so you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Wouldn't that be so easy? That's what we do, isn't it? It's so much easier. Paul, it's so much easier if we just show up at church. No, it takes more than just coming to church to develop the gifts within us. In other words, God has a purpose for you, and he has given you the gift to see that purpose through if you will stay focused and give your time and attention to it. It won't come automatically. And those around you will see your progress. They'll see you. They'll see growth in you. I was talking to someone the other night who remarked, just we were reflecting on the past year, how much he's grown in the past year, in the past several years. You know, the spiritual growth. And, and I know that. I see that. It's evident. And so I said, well, what do you attribute that to? What do you attribute your spiritual growth? And I was, expect, you know, I was expecting the answer. Well, Pastor Jim, you're such a great preacher. I come every Sunday and I listen to your preach. How can I not grow? No, that's not what I was expecting. As a matter of fact, I knew that wasn't the answer. I knew what the answer was. I just wanted to hear him say it. Because he's been studying his Bible. He's, not, he's been reading his Bible, but he's been doing more than reading. He's been studying it. He's been devouring his Bible. And, and of course you're going to grow. Of course it's going to be evident to all. It is evident to me that he's reading his Bible, that he's studying his Bible. I see the gifts being developed in him. He said, I fasted, I believe, for two weeks. I fasted and prayed for two weeks. And, and the clarity, I have such clarity of the will of God in my life. Oh, who to thunk it? I, I fast and I pray and, and God's will becomes clear to me. Guess what? It became clear to me. 
It's clear to me as an observer. I see the progress because he's doing what? He's putting in the work. He's sacrificing the time. He's sacrificing the meals. He's denying himself. And, and of course God is going to be developing those gifts within him. It takes work. It takes effort. What would the church look like if we were all doing that? If we were working sacrificing, giving ourselves to the developing, not neglecting the gift of God within us. Seeing our cause. We would have prophets. We would have teachers. We would have evangelists. We would have pastors. Wouldn't we? Look here at verse 2. It says, The Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. I think, again, this again is a pattern for how God works through the local church to raise up people within the church to do ministry. I spoke to someone else recently who who I just see leadership gifts in. I see, you know, that's part of my job. But I I said, brother, I see leadership gifts in you. But you got to develop him. You got to get serious minded about God. You got to put, you got to let the distractions go and become focused on the things of God, on developing that gift within you, developing your relationship with Jesus. You're going to get to heaven, but you're wasting the gift. You're wasting the gift that God's put within you. You know, and I hope he took it to heart. I hope he gets serious because I see leadership potential. You know, where are the leaders rising up? Where are the prophets rising up? Listen, if I see a gift, you need to focus on these things to develop that gift, not to neglect it. See, we've, we're, we've come to two camps, it seems. We have those who, you know, they, they, we neglect the gift because it freaks us out. Prophecy, you know, I, I don't know, teaching, that's all these, we neglect it because we don't, or we've been taught that they don't exist. And then we have the other side of the spectrum where, where you know, we focus on the gifts and, and, and the whole service is about, is about the, you know, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And, and it's the other extreme where everything's about how we feel and, and did God move today in some way. And, you know, I listened to a Pentecostal preacher yesterday for old time's sake. <laughs> and, um, and it was awesome. I mean, he's yell, yelling and shouting, and, but it was a lot of noise with just a little bit of substance. It's like there's a middle ground, isn't there? God wants us to exercise the gifts within. Don't neglect them. And what does Paul say? Don't abuse them either. It's not about the gifts. God gives us these gifts for a purpose. The purpose isn't so you feel good, so you feel like you had an experience in church. No, they're for the building up of the church, for the edifying of the church. They have a purpose. We have to find the purpose. Don't neglect them and don't abuse them, but use them. Amen. This is a model. Is what Paul was doing with for Timothy. This is how God works. I hope you're seeing the functioning of the church here. They're worshiping together in one accord. In that, God uses prophets to speak to them, to speak to them all. That Barnabas and Saul are separated to God for the ministry he's called them. And like I said, we get the rest of the book of Acts because the church functions properly. And Paul and Barnabas listened and they left. They went out. How many churches today, if the leader, if the pastor leaves, are just going to fall apart? I believe, I, thankfully, that after five years, if something happened to me today, if I was either called out of here or if I die, this church is okay. You're not going anywhere. You have become strong enough as a body to, that you will be willing to stay together and, and, and pray and wait and for God to provide leadership. You know, that, that this church doesn't rest on me, that you've grown past that. But how many churches have not grown past? If the pastor leaves, if the entertainment leaves, they're just going to fall apart. Well, we're going to find another church with another pastor to entertain us. With another, So that's not how the body of church functions. When we come together, and we're not even there yet. We're not, we're not exercising our gifts. I want God to interrupt our services. I want God to use your gifts. I want to see those gifts developed and God to interrupt us that the Holy Spirit could speak to us and tell us what he has to, to comfort us, to edify us. Amen. I had two prayer requests when I moved from New Jersey to Delaware in 2007. My primary 
prayer requests, the number one thing I prayed for, in hindsight, there were other things I should have prayed for on, as well, like, like work. <laughs> but but my prim- the, the, really, the one thing I wanted, my primary prayer request was that, that God would send me to a church that just let God be God that didn't get in the way, that didn't interrupt, that let God be God. Now, I moved from Burlington, New Jersey. How many miles is that? 120 miles maybe to to Sussex County, to Crossroad. How many churches did I have to pass? How many churches did God have me drive by to get to the one church where I would find a pastor that let God be God? You know, and, and, and I found that immediately in Pastor Rick, and I've been there since 2007, and, and he hasn't changed one bit. God has given him wisdom. Wisdom to let God be God, to not get in the way with, with man-made ideas and thoughts and, and how to build a church. He just lets God be God, and, and, and that hasn't changed, and I appreciate that so much. Just let God be God. Let people, let people exercise the gifts within them, develop the gifts within them, and, and be used by God as God would see fit, you know, and Stay out of the whole way and let the Holy Spirit lead. And under Pastor Rick, he saw in me a Timothy. He saw me a Timothy, somebody that could be you, somebody that could be a pastor. And he separated me for the work which God called me. There were better men for the job, but I was the one that God called. I didn't go to Crossroad and sit in the seat and say, here I am, Lord. I'm waiting for your call. Show Pastor Rick that I'm the guy. When Dagsboro calls, here I am. Now, what did Pastor Rick see? He saw me exercising the gifts that were in me. He saw me in the prison ministry. He saw me teaching men's Bible study. Listen, I wasn't good. I was not a teacher, but, but God called me to be a teacher. And I said, okay, and it was rough. It was rough in the beginning. But it's been, how many years have I been doing men's Bible study? 14 years? And guess what? I've gotten better. I've developed the gift that God put within me by exercising it and doing other things. So I'm not saying this to talk about myself. I'm saying it as an example that they will, people will notice your progress. They will see you exercising the gifts in you, and then you will be able to fulfill the call that I had placed on your life. God showed through me exercising the gifts that I was the one called for this position. Listen, we are all called to something. Where do I start? I don't know. Where do you start? I'll tell you what, where you don't start, you don't start just sitting there doing nothing. Where did Joyce and I start? We had young kids. We started in the nursery. Anybody can do the nursery. All you got to do is keep them alive for for an hour. (laughs) Keep them from getting hurt. It's not that hard. It's not that hard. But it's a start. And God says, okay, if you can be faithful with that, if you can keep a child alive for 40 minutes to an hour, well, you can, I was so grateful when my kids got old enough where, where I didn't have to, where they can go to children's church and I didn't have to do nursery. Because my goodness, I was t- done with that. And, and, and God said, well, go you know, help with the youth. Work underneath a youth pastor and develop those gifts within you to, to learn how to minister and care for, for young people. And for years, I did that for years and years, along with other things. But, you know, with going out and, and hanging out with Brother Tyrone and, and ministering in the streets and in the homeless and in the prisons. And, and all the while, God's developing gifts in me that led me to my calling here as a pastor. Listen, it begins by stepping out and doing something doing something, showing up, showing up at the Thanksgiving thing and, and finding out where, you, where your gifting is, showing up to ring the bell. It's like, man, I know this isn't as hard as I thought. Showing up to, to sing one night. <laughs> Can I, I got to say it because <laughs> you gave it to me. Brother Richard, I hear him singing. I hear, I was like, man, that guy can sing. He carries you guys. But between, I was said between him and Dave, they carry us as a congregation. They could sing. And, and he stepped up and he sang on a Thursday night with the, with the praise team. And, and he was so nervous. <laughs> he couldn't eat all day. 
he couldn't eat all day, but he exercised his gift. Now he's like, you know what? It wasn't so bad. Maybe I could do that more. Maybe I should call Rhonda and see if I can be put on a praise team and use the gift that God's anointed me with. Do something. Step out and do something and you will find your gifting. That's how you find it. God will develop those things within you. And then the calling that he already placed on your life. will. It, it will listen. Paul and and Silas and Barnabas were called a long time ago. Paul was called 13 years ago to be a missionary. This is 13 years later. Guess what? After exercising the gifts, after developing those gifts, God now says, okay, now go. Now go. He didn't sit around waiting for God to say go. He did. He was working the whole time, developing those gifts within him. That's how the church functions. That's how the church works. Where are the prophets in this room? Listen, there is no doubt in my mind that God has called some of you to be prophets. Where are the teachers in this room? Where are the pastors? I mean, what, what do you think that, that, like, I mean, thankfully, I'm only 53, but eventually I'm going to die, right? Where are the pastors? You think, do I think this is it? Am I it? Am I, am I the last one? Or is God raising up pastors in this room? Where are the evangelists? Those who God has gifted. Listen, I'm an evangelist, but I am not gifted to be an evangelist. Pastor Ross is gifted to be an evangelist. I watched him Tuesday, man, walking around the hospital. I was like, I'm here, but he's the evangelist. He's gifted to be an evangelist. I mean, it's amazing. I, I do it, but I'm not, and I'm growing in it, but I'm not gifted in it. It doesn't mean we don't do it. Where are the evangelists? Where are those God wants to, God is gifted with the gift to really meet people at their need and minister and recognize when they're ready to, to receive Jesus? I mean, he said two prayers with people that I'm like, he's like, are you, and just salvation prayers. He's like, are you ready? I'm like, I don't think so. They're like, yeah, I'm ready. I'm like, wow, that's a gift. That's a gift he has. God has gifted some in this room. There's no doubt in my mind. No doubt doubt in my mind that he has gifted some to be evangelists, some to be prophets, some to be teachers, some to be pastors. God isn't working because the gifts have ceased. Men have ceased putting in the work and the sacrifice to develop those gifts within them. Church, it's time to get serious, to begin developing the gift that God has for you. It's time to start doing something, amen. Time to get serious, time to get focused. Praise God. I hope you hear me. I'm not trying to make us Pentecostal. Guess what? We're all Pentecostal. Are you filled with the Holy Ghost? Are you filled with, don't be afraid of what the Holy Ghost wants to do in and through you, amen. Amen. Lord, help us. Help us to put aside our inhibitions. Help us to put aside what, what we think is weird and crazy. Lord, everything you do has order. When we operate in your giftings, there's order, Lord, and your word guides us in that order so they don't get out of hand. Lord, I thank you for the Pentecostal upbringing I have, but I don't want to go back there. I thank you that I wasn't brought up in a dry, spiritless church, but that you've brought me to a place of understanding that there is a place for the gifts that you've given us, Lord, that we need and must operate in those gifts, that we don't neglect them, and we don't abuse them, but we operate in those, we develop them within ourselves. You've given to them to us for a reason. Lord, let us not let them go to waste. Lord, your church can be so much better than it is today. You have so much more for us if we would just walk in, in what you've called us to do. If we put in the effort, make, put aside the time, make the sacrifices to know your will, to know your plans, to know your purposes for us, that we begin serving you, Lord, in prayer, in worship, in fasting, to, to, to hear you clearly. Lord, you're, you're, this world needs, needs a church that's listening to you, that, that has placed you at the center, excuse me, the center of it all. Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. I love that song. Nothing else matters. When our eyes aren't fixed on you as the center, there's nothing but chaos. And we just get dizzy. Just get dizzy. Just like a merry-go-round. If our eyes aren't focused on you at the center, we get caught up in the chaos and the anxiety and the, the dizziness of this world. 
Lord, may our eyes be fixed on you and your plans and your purpose for us all. You are the center. Nothing else matters. May we have the mindset of Christ. May we have our eyes fixed on you. Have your way. Have your way in our lives. May your word linger on our hearts that we would remember that each of us is value, a valued member of the kingdom, of the family of God. We all have a purpose, Lord. We all have a purpose, a reason for being here. Lord, I thank you for this body of Christ that we've grown thus far. But Lord, you have so much, there's so much for us, to, so many places for us where we can grow still. Lord, I begin, I pray that you begin interrupting us, interrupting us with a word. Lord, the Holy Spirit said, the Holy Spirit, speak to us, Holy Spirit. Speak to us through your prophets, I pray. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Whew. Well, glory to God.